There we go. Can y'all hear that? Y'all hear yes, it when it says recording in progress? Okay. Yeah. And we also get a message pop up that lets us know that you're recording. Yeah, up at the top left there, I think. I mean, it's not, a, it's not on my little deal here, but, but anyway. Okay, verse 24 says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But when men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Let's see, get out of here. Okay, so I'm, I'm basically just showing in my note there that tares and chaff are two different things. Um, chaff is part of us, and wheat has to grow uh, out of this new birth that we have, but but it's all housed, you know, in a in a in a human being, and so um, you're not going to get rid of chaff until you finally go through your complete judgment. Chaff it has to do with the flesh. I think some of it could be even weaknesses of the flesh, not sin, but it's there, and it will be done away with once perfection's reached. But here, he said, while men slept, the enemy came and sowed tares among wheat. Um, uh, and went his way, and when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. The servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good and seed in thy field? From whence hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy have done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest we, while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into the barn. One of the things that I would say here is um, not only if you tried to destroy the tares, which a tear is not a wheat, it's not wheat at all, uh, the, the wheat here would be the people of God that have the word of God that's transforming their life. Tares is basically a counterfeit. I mean, you can there can be people in the church that there's there, I, you know you can have people in church that's never been born again that are that are a tear. However, I would say that a tear could become wheat. You know, just because it's there and it's a tear, it uh, Anything that's not a child of God can be born again if it meets the requirements of repentance and humility. So that would be another reason not to do, you know, not to gather up the, the tares. But also, um, you know, we're dealing with all kinds of aspects in the church. And I could give you, you know, maybe some example. I'm going to give you an example or two. Years and years ago, when I first came to the body, there was a church in the body that was uh, fairly a new assembly. And I was, you know, somewhat connected to it, knew about it. And there was new families coming in that church. And they were family members. They were all, all you know, this, there were several families that, that, you know, like one family got in this church and then another family heard about it. And another family is a large family. They were married, uh, family, men and women and their children, and then their married children. One of the things that happened was, is that a new, uh, a new uh, young man, and his fiance, they were already engaged when they went to church. And they they went to church and they hadn't been there two weeks, two or three weeks. 
and she received the Holy Ghost, and he didn't. Well, they already had their wedding planned. And so then this young man's parents was interested in the church, so they went to the church. But they weren't going to church. They knew they didn't know very much about God or the Bible. They, you know, they didn't know anything about the Holy Ghost, didn't have it. And uh, so when this young man and his fiance had was going, they were real excited about going. Well, she got the Holy Ghost. He didn't have it. So the pastor talked to them about that, that he felt that they should wait to get married until the young man got the Holy Ghost, that they both ought to have the Holy Ghost to marry. Well, they didn't understand that. That that they then, you know, that just didn't compute in their minds. And then, of course, the young man's dad and mother, that sure didn't compute in their mind. Here they're planning this wedding is just like a week or 10 days off or whatever. And um, you know, so the pastor uh he actually kind of forbade them to get married. And um, until they both had the Holy Ghost, well, this started an uproar in the church because there were several family members, other family members there too. <clears throat> I would say you could call these that weren't born again tares and the ones that <laughs> were wheat. Uh, <clears throat> the mother and father knew me they were upset about it so they called me and wanted to know if I would this was in a total different state they wanted to know if I would drive there and marry this couple <laughs> I said you you can't do that to me I, I can't come into another man's town and go against what he's doing I said um you know, I understand your situation, and I might be able to try to talk a little bit to the pastor about it, but I was young at the time, and anyway, make a long story short, it, it created quite a problem, and they wound up quitting the church, and they wound up going ahead and getting married in her, the, the Baptist church she used to go to. Anyway, so I'm just showing you how you you start trying to tear deal with the tares, you're gonna tear up some wheat too if you're not careful. So it, you know, I mean in this particular case, if that happened in our church today, it would depend. Yeah, there's so many different things. I, I'll give you another an example. Uh I had a, a young couple uh many years ago in our church in Missouri and they came to church. They were not married. They had children. They were living together. The woman got the Holy ghost and the man didn't have it, but they came to me and said, we, we realize we need to be married. And so could y'all see that up there where it says for me to admit that one? Do y'all see that? You didn't. Okay. So a deal did pop up. Somebody was trying to enter in, which I let them in. Anyway, <clears throat> so I married them. I didn't wait on him to get the Holy Ghost. I mean, they're living in fornication. They got children. And, you know, I think there's, you have to look at exceptions to the rule. You got to realize, you know, what's going on. Yeah, I know some of y'all are guessing who this is, but... <laughs> As many of you been around a long time. Anyway, uh, but but I'm just showing you, you know, even in a case like this right here, these are these these are newborns or babes in Christ. I would probably marry them. There just has to be some exceptions. There's a general rule, then there's exceptions to rules. But I wouldn't destroy a, a whole, you know, several families by knowing that they didn't have any understanding of, of why that rule's there 
It just takes time to get enough understanding of the word of God. Anyway, that's not my main point here, of course. But uh, he said, to gather, gather the wheat into barn, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seed, but when it's grown, it's the greatest among herbs and cometh a tree, so that the birds there come and lodge in the branches thereof. Another parable spake he unto them, uh, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which woman took, hid three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. And all these things spake Jesus in the multitude and parables without a parable spake he not unto them. The way I teach that where a woman took and hid three measures of meal and the whole thing was leaven, I th I would say that this has to do with the the strange woman, the spirit of the strange woman that hid measures uh, to the teachings of the law, the prophets, and the teachings of Christ. It, there was error in all the teachings that the whole thing became leaven. Leaven is falsehood. That's what it represents in the Bible. It's, it's like air that, like you put yeast in bread, it puffs it up. There ain't nothing there but air. It's nothing. There, there's. That's why it was required in the holy place that a table of showbread was uh, was unleavened bread, and of course the Passover meal had to have unleavened bread. You couldn't eat leaven. Um, you, you had to eat unleavened bread. Uh, Jesus told the Pharisees, "Be, be." I mean, his disciples, beware of the. Uh, of the leaven of the Pharisees. But then, verse 36, Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. They got the rest of it, but they weren't sure about what he was trying to tell them about the tares or how that was going to work. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. And he answered and said unto him, he that soweth, I mean, the field is the world, verse 38, and good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one, the flesh. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. I think you ought to make note here that the harvest is the end of the world. See, some preachers are trying to preach, even in the body of Christ, that the harvest is taking place all the time, anytime. But Jesus himself declared that the harvest is in the end of the world. God doesn't harvest a world until it's the end of the harvest. It's always in the latter rain, time of harvest. Um, you know, before they went across the uh, Jordan River, it was a time of the harvest. It was the latter rain. Um, Jordan had overswelled their banks. That in the spring of the year, the snow melts out of the mountains, uh, and 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 it the snow runs down into the streams and rivers and the rivers run into ran, ran into Jordan River. I mean the streams and this uh, uh, melting of the snow run down and it overswelled Jordan Bank, Jordan's banks. And it always it always lets you know that it's in the time of the harvest. It, it, you know uh, before they could go into the promised land, you know, they had to cross Jordan's swelling river which was it swelled because of the harvest. That's what's going to happen in the end of this world. Babylon is going to swell. All Everything's going to run together into one beast system. And it won't be until the end of the world that God manifests himself fully and judges it. He won't, he won't, uh, he'll rise up. He waits till wickedness comes to its fullness. 
in a world. He lets it develop until it comes to a full uh, state of, of, of its uh, wicked condition, and it's come to a complete state of wickedness. It's not going to go any further. It always winds up in a dragon condition. And then God raises up a ministry with a sevenfold light with, uh, how did Paul say it in uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 when he said that iniquity doth already work, and he who now letteth or hindereth doth hinder until he be taken out of the way. That's God. God hindered the church from falling away until he got everything out of that world he could get out of it and reaping it and and getting the harvest. But um, uh, and then he he let it go. There wasn't anything else to harvest. It was over. The harvest was over. And uh, and it said, in whom uh, uh, until and the man of perdition, perdition is revealed, which is the Pope, and it said, in whom he will destroy with the um, I can't remember if it says strength or power of his mouth, spirit That's of his mouth, the what? brightness. Spirit of his mouth. Spirit of his mouth and the brightness of his coming. So, and that shows the, the spirit of his mouth is a ministry that has the power to judge that system. And the brightness, which is a sevenfold light of his coming. The Lord doesn't come in judgment until the end of every world. And so, uh, Jesus isn't coming until it's time and wickedness has reached its full height and that God at the same time brings about the fullness of his power and glory and comes in judgment. He comes to judge the wickedness that's in the world and to judge everything and everybody else in the world. But you have to be subjected to all of the wickedness that's in the world. That's why, you know, sometimes you look at, excuse me, you don't think, I mean, if you look at the condition of the world today, you think um, it ain't time for Jesus to come. You know, the world's in too bad a shape. Well, that's, that's a shape it's got to get in for him to come. He can't judge your life until you've been subjected to the height of wickedness. You've got to overcome all that. You know, that's one of the things I've said. You, you've got to overcome the influence of the world, the wickedness of the world, the influence of religion. And you've got to overcome the you got to come over, you've got to overcome even your own individual. But there's a lot of factors that plays in it. You know, um, I was talking to a pastor just yesterday that called me, and he said, <laughs> he said, Brother Smith, this is a dangerous time for a man to be a pastor. I said, yes, it is. You're exactly right. Uh, and I don't know how many of you, uh, Brother Painter sent me a link. I, I have read about it, but he's, you know, he's, He's kind of kept me abreast of it, of how the Southern Baptist Convention uh, Church, Southern Baptist churches have, is it, is it Brother Painter, am I right? Is it over 400 men that um, have, have, uh, that, that they've had to deal with among them that's guilty of sexual abuse or they, that they've had to deal with that. Rather than not they've been convicted guilty of it, they're going to give out these names in Florida. So, uh, you know, I mean, right now, 
the investigation of the church is running rampant right now. And we don't have a government that has very much fear of God or reverence for the church. So, you know, uh, right now a man really has to have the wisdom of God to know how to find the the pathway of of safety in weaving his way, staying away from the civil. Uh, matters that are taking place with the church situations and uh, and the religious side of it. So, um, you know, any man right now, I've always said this for many, many years, I've, I've told men, ministers, and, and tried to follow this myself, don't, you know, I've told men, don't ever get alone with a woman, ever. Don't ever be in a alone situation. Get a witness. Get your wife with you or another somebody. It's not that we would uh, have a whole lot of fear concerning, you know, a, a true saint of God. And number one, it's just not, it don't look good. It's not, it, it's, it's not something that ought to be done. And then number two, uh, you know, you can have you can have women in your church that are not really dedicated to God, and if they get disgruntled for some reason, they could make any kind of false accusation against you and cause all kinds of trouble. So, you know, I we need to beef up in our own order of the local church of making sure that we make notes of everything that we keep records. I, that's something that I'm, that's not my forte and I, you know, but I, it's something we need to work on. But anyway, uh, the condition of this world is in a bad condition. But at my point here, I'm trying to tell you that uh, the God doesn't harvest. He harvests in the end of the world. He waits till wickedness comes to its fullness. It was that way in the Jewish world. If you'd looked at the condition of the Jewish world, you all have heard me say this before, it was in pitiful condition. It was in every bit as bad a condition, if not worse, than we're in today. And so much that they rejected the very Son of God, that they had been, uh, they had been taught, prophesied to of his coming for a 2,000-year period, and they missed it completely. The, the all of the Jewish uh, religious leaders missed it and was against Christ. They were, uh, John called them the Antichrist. They were against Christ. He that confesses not that Jesus has come in the flesh is Antichrist, John said. Um, okay. Verse 40 here says, and therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire. So shall it be in the end of the world. So there's where God's going to judge in the end of the world. The son of man will send forth his angels and they'll gather out of his kingdom all that offend and them that do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father who hath ears, let him hear. So God's going to, he, he will, how did he say that? He would gather, send forth his angels and they'll gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. That's the 18th chapter of the book of Revelation. God's going to get all of his people out of there before, but but God, even before that happens, God's going to gather all of the religious elements that's going to make up the beast. Uh, you know, I have had several ministers down through the years try to convince me that Revelations 18 has already took place. You know, showing that we, you know, God called us out, those of us that were in Babylon like myself. Well, it's true that God may have called some of us out of it, but that's not the calling out of Babylon, the beast system, the harlot. 
it's it's not until the end of the world that God that it's going to all come together. This, the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation, God began um, God begins to tell the angel to explain to John who this woman is that's riding this scarlet colored beast and all about that's what the 17th chapter is all about. And that's not until the beast is set up. Then in the 18th chapter, God begins. So God's going to gather them together in the way that the way that his ministry gathers out of his kingdom. All those that offend is we preach the truth of the word of God as the church is being restored. And everyone that can't accept that will leave this message and join up with a secular church, a Babylonian church eventually will become part of the beast. Just the things that I've just said to you helps you to understand how a person with a weak vision, I would venture to say there's already people left the body of Christ because of some of the things that's happened recently that have they have a weak vision and they're it scared them. They're scared and they don't want to be connected with anything that you know is is that God's allowing these things to happen that's bringing about a certain element of judgment and that that causes people to gather together in these other systems how is it that that um, i think it's said in in rebel in hebrews we haven't got there yet i'm i'm sorry that i'm not talking on Hebrews tonight, but I'll I'll try to get back on it Sunday morning. Um, to be honest with you, I'm just a little bit scattered in my mind as to who I'm talking to and what I'm talking about. I've been talking to you know different people. Uh, I'm talking to the new pastors in the Dominican Republic on Saturdays. I'm talking on Monday nights to the to the people in the Dominican Republic that have are seasoned, and and uh, those in Mexico, and and uh, then I'm talking to some of the, I'm talking to the Haitians, and uh, so I'm just getting back from a weekend where we we didn't discuss this part right here altogether, but we did discuss um, uh, we discussed the end of the world quite a bit. Okay, here's a scripture I wanted to mention. Um, it says, "For but you are come here in the, uh, uh, Hebrews 12, 22, but you are come unto Zion, Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem and into an innumerable company of angels. That's, that's a ministry, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Of course, this is talking to the New Testament church back there, which are written in heaven and to God, the judge of all, the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that you refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. And right there, he's referring back to when Moses went up on the mountain. It burned with fire. It shook the earth. He starts off in the beginning of this chapter telling about that. But he's showing now you come to Mount Zion, the, the, the new heavenly Jerusalem, the body of Christ is what he's saying. But then he said, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised saying, yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. Let me bring that up. And this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken 
as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. In other words, you know, God is going to shake everything. He's going to shake everything with, and so that 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 cannot be shaken will remain. In other words, God, for God to know that we're, we really are his servants and that we really have a vision of what he's doing. Uh, he won't do this until the church is established. And I don't think this shaking takes place to shake the whole body necessarily, but I think God shakes each one of us. I mean, there's things he'll do that will shake the whole body to an extent, but I think each one of us individually will go through a shaking to see whether or not we'll be shook out. We God has to take us through things uh, to see if we're going to stand pat, if we're going to stand on our convictions, and that you know, I mean, there how if you're headed into perfection, you got to get to some place where you are stable enough that nothing's going to shake you, like the Apostle Paul. How was it he said it when he said? Nothing can re, uh, uh, remove me or, or from the from the love of God. Uh, you know, and he went through all those things that could have uh, that could have took him out, but he was convinced. Let's go to that scripture. That's in Romans. Uh, let's see if we can find that. Let me think right quick. Well, Maybe somebody can look it up in the concordance for us there. Uh, Romans 8, Dr. Brother Smith. Huh? Romans 8, 38. 8, 38, okay. I was trying to think, is it 8 or 9? Yeah. Um, yeah, here it is. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, those angels there would have to be ministers here on earth or, you know, messengers that that uh, might would try to, you know, maybe uh, of the one of the Levitical priesthood, you know, either the Pharisees, Sadducees, some of them, but but neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, that would take you into civil powers of Rome, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, neither height, depth, or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So, you know, uh, it's a, that's what I'm saying here. Who shall separate us? Back up to 35. From the love of Christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, peril or sword. I mean, every one of us, there is no way you can serve God and stay committed to him and not be uh, at times have to go over in your mind, am I going to stick with, am, am I going to keep doing this? Is it, Am I doing the right thing? Or am I going to quit? Am I going to quit the body of Christ? You know, there's, there's things you, you, you know, I've used that in the book of Ruth several times to show how Naomi said, go back, just go back to Moab. And, and Orpah did, but, but Ruth, she had, God had revealed too much to her. And, but I, I think there's a picture in that, that God's in that. God will test you and see if he'll just see, you know, uh, if you got enough of this that, that you can't be run off or, or can you be run off? Um, and that's not saying that, I do believe there's victims. I believe there's people that gets hurt in churches that they're not strong enough. They're not stable enough. 
and that things can happen that, that they can become victims. God won't forget them if they're his children. He'll he'll remember them. He'll do everything in his power to get them to get them back and save them. Sometimes God has to let uh, what's the word I'm looking for when oh I can't think of the word I'm trying to think of, you know, when somebody becomes a victim or um What's the word I'm looking for? In other words, when they become a part of the damage that takes place and something that's going on, that's not the word I'm looking for. But it's right on the tip of my tongue. It makes me so mad. Um, um, anyway, so uh, I, I mainly, you know, I wanted to kind of start off just letting you know, I wanted to, you to make a note that the harvest is in the end of the world. Some people miss that. Um, uh, here in 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, it said, for we must all appear for the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Well, God's going to have to visit. He's got to deal with us and help us. But if you look at Psalms 96, Psalms 96, 97, and um, 98 are, um, these Psalms are talking about Jesus coming in the end of a world. Um, but first, let me go to Isaiah. I'll be done here in just a little while, but Isaiah 40, I believe. It's just, it's just come to my mind. Where, let's see. Okay. Right here in verse 10, it says, Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand. That's, that's his ministry. And his arm will rule for him. His arm is, is Jesus. God's arm that reaches from heaven all the way into the earth is Jesus. And the hand on the end of that arm is a fivefold ministry. And his arm will rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him. Remember, uh, uh, God, God's, he's bringing his reward with him for all the judgment. He, he does that, that reward takes place even in a resurrection. Matthew 27, 52, the restored church and his work before him. He'll feed his flock like a shepherd. He'll gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom. That's his covenant. And shall gently lead those that are with young. Who, who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out heaven with the span. You have heard me talk on that, that he's meted out the waters, you know, you know, he, he holds the water, he holds the world in the palm of his hand. He measures the waters. He judges everything in the, in the world. He judges the whole world. He judges his people. He judges everything in the world in the hollow of his hand and meted out heaven with a span there a span is three palm widths that's what a span measurement is and those three palm widths is the early church the ministry of the early church the ministry of the restored church and the millennial reign God will, he measures and he judges. He meted out heaven. He, he makes up, up heaven or eternity with uh, a span, three, three judgments of eternal judgments in the world. Uh, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure. That's the flesh. And weighed the mountains and scales. He judged all the mountains of religion and the heels in a balance. He, he puts them in a balance. 
And so uh, now let's go to uh, Psalms 96. It says, O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing of the Lord all the earth. Sing of the Lord. Bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen. His wondrous wonders among the people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come unto his courts. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. The world also shall be established that it should not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar. That's, that's talking about the world. You know, Revelations, a, Revelations 4, is that 11, where it says, and the nations were angry. Same thing is what he's saying here. Let the sea roar. When Jesus, that's exactly what happened in the end of the Jewish world. The whole world, Jewish world and Roman world, turned against him. He made every one of them mad. And the fullness thereof, let the field be joyful and all that is therein. Then shall the trees of the wood rejoice before the Lord, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He'll judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. Now, 97 said, the Lord reigneth. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of isles be glad thereof. I'm giving you these three chapters in Psalms because it's talking about the coming of the Lord and his judgment, his final eternal judgment in the end of a world. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. A fire goes before him and burneth up his enemies round about, his lightnings enlightened, enlightened the world. The earth saw and trembled. The hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord. I was talking about hills. That's just little religious groups that couldn't stand before the truth of the word of God or the manifestation that was in his ministry. At the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth, the heavens declare his righteousness and all the people see his glory. That won't happen till the end of the world in a, in a harvest time. Confounded be all they that serve graven engines, images and boast themselves of idols and worship him. Worship him, all ye gods. Zion heard and was glad, and the daughters of Judah rejoiced because of thy judgments, O Lord. For thou, Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above gods. You, ye that love the Lord, hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivered them out of the hand of the wicked. Light is snow. Light is sown for the righteous. His gladness for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. And then here's this last chapter. It says, O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm had gotten him the victory. That took place in the early church. It'll take place again down here. The Lord hath made known his salvation. His righteousness hath he openly showed in the sight of the heathen. He remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of the Lord. See, that hadn't yet happened yet. God hadn't manifested himself yet like he did in the early church. Make a joyful noise in the Lord, all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Sing in the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the voice of a song, with trumpets, sound of cornet. Make 
a joyful noise before the Lord, the King. Let the sea roar. There it is again. Let the world be mad. When God starts manifesting itself, it's going to make everybody, you know, it's going to make the world, the world of religion and the world of civil powers mad and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord, for he cometh to judge the earth with righteousness shall he judge the world and the people with equity. So um, I just thought I would, uh, you know, it, it, this is something I've kind of had on my mind lately, so I thought well, I would share it with you. Um, and again, uh, <laughs> to, to be honest with you, I, I sort of forgot that who I was talking to and that we're working on the book of Hebrews. So we'll have to insert that in, you know, I don't know how you can do that, brother painter. We, we've, we had it set up before when I talked on it, that, it, you know, it all came together. You could, you could post it and it all be together. Well, this is going to be out of sync for sure. But anyway, I'm going to get back on it Sunday. Again, I am, uh, I'm looking forward to tomorrow night fellowship. I don't think we have enough fellowship in our church. And as I said before, we're going to start, uh, we will start back up uh, Wednesday nights after the campground. And uh, so that'll give us, I'm kind of looking forward to our, our elders meetings that we have at seven o'clock before the 7.30 service starts. He used to try to touch on, you know, just communicate among us elders so we knew what was going on in the church and that we were working on that. I'm looking forward to those things again and a little more time to spend together. And, and um, you know, we may do some more things like we're doing tomorrow night. We can even do some of that on a Wednesday night even. It doesn't have to, you know, Friday night's fine. But even midweek, you know, we could have a, uh, it, it, it may be a little bit harder to do, you know, because we've got a next, well, it's not a weekend where you can kind of rest, rest up, but, but I still think we could do it anyway. So, um, oops, where did you, what did I do wrong here in just a second? There we go. I don't know that y'all see it now anyway, did you? I don't think you did. What I did was is I opened my Bible up full screen where it removed all of y'all for a second until I reduced it back down. Anyway, let's pray before we leave tonight. Uh, remember again, Brother Gary Wright is in the hospital. He's in very critical condition. He really is. Uh, I don't think I don't think they're expecting him to pass away right at any moment. I talked to Brother Brown today. I talked to Chad, Gary's son today. Yeah, Brother Chad told me, he said, well, they're not saying that he's at death's door, but he's he's in bad shape. You know, and they're feeling like they can get this the infection that's in his body. They're feeling like they can probably get that under control and get his kidneys working back as good as they could possibly work for him in the condition he's in. Uh, anyway, that's their hopes that they can do. But if he, he's got to get better to get, uh, I've done some research on it. I'll explain a little bit about it to you. Uh, uh, when you have cancer of the bone marrow, the, in your bone marrow is where your blood vessels are manufactured. They start out in little baby uh, blood cells, both white and red blood cells. It starts out in your bone marrow. And so it is actually a type of leukemia. There's different types of leukemia and it um you you can Google it. I mean it's 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 you can research it. It's, 
um, it um, it is an incurable. What what he has is incurable. Ten years ago, it was a death sentence. Today, they can treat it, but in Brother Wright's case, the treatment he was receiving would last him over two months. Now it don't it what well, it got down to where it wouldn't last him but about two weeks. And what's happening is is the cancer is working faster against the treatment. The treatment can't hold it back. The treatment does uh, have chemotherapy in it. And so the cancer is developed stronger and, and it's fighting the treatment. So if this, this, the treatment they were giving him is not working anymore, and so they're going to try a different treatment. But he's got down so low that they can't give him a treatment. He, he, he's not strong enough to take a treatment. Uh, it, every time he takes a treatment, it, it, it makes him weaker. He, he, you know, it takes him a while to get over. It. it takes him two or three weeks to build back up, at least a couple of weeks generally after a treatment. He's too weak to take a treatment right now. And it's been a month since he's had one. He should have had one. He should have had one two weeks ago at the minimum. So he's he's a lot weaker and a lot worse shape. And so, you know, it's just nip and tuck, it seems like. But that gives you a little bit of understanding of what his condition is. Um, we need, we really need God to help him. Um, and then my, my little niece, Bonnie Garza has got pancreatic cancer and they thought they possibly was going to have to do uh, surgery on her a couple of weeks ago and that she, they didn't think she'd live through the surgery if they did. Uh, if, if I think I'm right about this, I don't think that she had the surgery and she is improving some or she's still got the cancer so there you go um anyway um then brother goss still needs our prayers he did go back in the hospital last week i don't know if he's still in there or not is he sister McNabb? No. no he he came back out again last sunday um i don't know really what happened or anything like that but they, I don't know if they determined anything, but he's back home again and seems to be doing okay. okay. The best that he, is, that he can be for where he's at. Yes. So we want to pray for Brother Goss and the Keswick Church and all. Um, and, and I do want to state this. I'm telling you the best I know about Brother Wright's condition. If, I, if I've made a mistake, it's an honest mistake. I don't I'm just telling you the best I've been able to come up with and some of the research I've done, some of what's been told me by those, that, you know, his son and even Brother Brown, but but um, I don't claim to have all the answers. Let me stop the recording here. <laughs>